Yeah, I don't think Mother knew about this. Uncle Marvin was strangled by his own beard. Yeah, he never saw it coming. Hey, you have found us. It is Extreme Genes, America's family history show, and ExtremeGenes.com. Nice to have you along. It's Fisher here, your radio root sleuth on the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. And this segment is brought to you by MyHeritage.com. A couple of great guests today. First of all, I've been working on helping a friend of mine identify his birth father. And in the process, we came across some weird results on his DNA. So I called Paul Woodbury from LegacyTree.com, the DNA specialist there, and talked about some of these results. And he came up with a completely different conclusion than I did looking at it. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. The links, the centimorgans, what do they mean? It's going to be a little science episode for you today. So we hope you'll pay close attention to that coming up in about nine minutes. Maureen Taylor is going to be here today. She's the photo detective, of course. We're going to talk about houses in pictures. And I'm excited, by the way, that Maureen is my very first guest for our Extreme Genes Patrons Club Members Only Podcast. And you can sign up for this thing. It's so easy. Just go to patreon.com slash extreme genes or just click on the Patrons Club button on the Extreme Genes website. You can sign up right there. You know, it's a simple thing. It's like for a buck, you get mentioned on the site. For $3, you get early access to the podcast. For $5 a month, you get a couple of bonus podcasts that are commercial free and uh, long form it's a lot of fun and for eight bucks you're going to be part of live online ask me anything type sessions so we'd love to have you be part of that sign up right now patreon.com slash extreme genes i mean it's like less than the cost of a hamburger and fries every month okay a real juicy one but still very cheap And speaking of fun stuff, David Allen Lambert, Chief Genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society, AmericanAncestors.org. We had a winner working with you, somebody who had signed up for our weekly Genie newsletter. She became a subscriber, and we picked her name. And Mary Lore, how did she do with your live session? Oh, she did really well. In fact, we talked for a half hour. She still has a half hour left, and we talked about her War of 1812 ancestor out in Indiana and the Iowa territories. And, you know, we're offering another hour with David, a free hour consultation for subscribers to the Weekly Genie Newsletter. You can sign up at ExtremeGenes.com. We'll have another winner drawn at the end of the month, so we're closing in on that, so make sure you take care of it. David, good to have you along. Let's get into our family our news. we got a lot of stories this week. We really do. In fact, another surprising find, this time not on eBay like you had last week, <laughs> but... Uh, Jane Fine Foster had spent over 14 years searching for her mom's vintage wedding photos. This wedding occurred in 1948. They were lost due to a missing payment from a storage unit. Uh Uh-oh. But guess what? They turned up. One day, the Colorado woman was shopping in Grand Junction when she stopped and spotted her mother's wedding pictures in the window of an antique shop. She couldn't (laughs) believe her eyes. Wow. Needless to say, she went in and got them. (laughs) Yeah, no kidding. And not just the pictures, the wedding dress itself was in there. Isn't that amazing? It is. I mean, you talk about serendipity in uh, family history. Great stuff. All right, what else do you have? Well, I'll tell you, our next story is kind of a back-to-school story. All the kids are back in school, and of course, that includes the royal family. So here's a little bit of a genealogical name conundrum for you. So when Prince Harry and Prince William were using their names, they were Harry Wales and William Wales, since their father is the Prince of Wales. Right, because they don't have a family name, right? Correct. The royal family has a different official surname, which is Mountbatten-Windsor, which is a combination of the Queen and Prince Philip's last name Mountbatten before becoming Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. Sure. But the little four-year-old prince now will be known as George Cambridge at school (laughs) because his parents are the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. And, of course, that will eventually change to George Wales when his father becomes the Prince of Wales, when his father becomes king, or it might even supersede it if his father becomes king and his grandfather doesn't. That's very complicated. (laughs) It really is. Well, our next story goes a little further north, all the way up a mountain in Norway, where a person who is a reindeer hunter 
found an 1,100-year-old weapon, a Viking sword. Wow. Oh, <laughs> How cool is that? Not preserved, but not bad for something that had been sitting on the ground for that many years. It's amazing because they were sitting on, like, piles of rocks out mm-hmm. in the open this whole time, but uh, it's in pretty good shape. I think it's amazing, you know, just like our little friend who was found up in the Alps there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> who knows uh, what else might be found as the ice recedes a little bit more. Our next story goes back a ways, and it also has a Viking spin on it. Back in the 1880s, there was a grand burial that was found, and researchers figured it was a grave of a Viking warrior that was a man. Well, not the right sex, because DNA has proven now that the warrior was, in fact, a lady. Yeah, and an officer, too. I mean, there's all kinds of trinkets buried with her that indicates she was in charge. So it, it looks like the Viking squads were open to women leading their ranks. So you just never know where DNA is rewriting the history of even those that have been <laughs> dead for many, many years. This week's blogger spotlight is Couric, C U R R A C H, dot John J. Tierney, T-I-E-R-N-E-Y dot com. John Tierney has a wonderful blog, but what is different about his is he has tools and downloads available, including genealogy maps, a simple census age table, a 10-generation Excel chart, Ireland cemeteries. He's kind of broken down from fine degree of how to get right into the counties. And an Ancestry Pie chart, which is kind of fun. Download these tools for free on his website. And, of course, we're going to have the link to that on our website, Extreme Genes, so you don't have to remember all that. Just click on it. Exactly. Remember, if you're not a member of NEHGS, you can become a free guest member by going to AmericanAncestors.org. And if you want to become a member, use the checkout code EXTREME and save an extreme $20 off of our regular membership, which is eighty nine ninety five, or any other membership level that you choose. All right. Very nice, David. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you again next week. Have a good one. Thank you. You too, my friend. All right. And coming up next, we're going to talk to Paul Woodbury. We're going to get a little scientific talking about DNA. What are these centimorgans and shared segments? What's that all about? He'll make an attempt to explain it to me coming up next in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Did you know that Family Search Family Tree is available through a powerful new mobile app experience? That's right. Now you can view, edit, and even add information to ancestors in your family tree whenever and wherever you are. You no longer need to wait to get home or make a date with your computer to view or update your family tree. You can add details to your tree when visiting with family or when capturing details from a trip to the cemetery. You can share new family history discoveries from classroom settings. You can even make the most of your time when waiting for doctor appointments or car repairs. Get started today by downloading the free Family Search Family Tree app to your Apple or Android device. Visit familysearch.org slash tree app to get the Family Tree app for free. Exploring and expanding your family tree has never been more convenient. Visit familysearch.org slash tree app to download the Family Search Family Tree mobile app today. Hi, Genies. It's Scott Fisher, host of Extreme Genes, with an invitation for you to join our brand spanking new Extreme Genes Patrons Club. Now, the Extreme Genes Patrons Club is where, for as little as a dollar a month, Genies everywhere can take advantage of Extreme Genes rewards, such as early access to our latest podcasts, members-only bonus podcasts, acknowledgement on ExtremeGenes.com, and special monthly live online question and answer sessions with well-known family history experts. Catch visits with Ginny Genealogy stars such as David Allen Lambert, photo detective Maureen Taylor, DNA expert C.C. Moore, and many other experts and storytellers. If you find yourself craving more stories, more ideas for digging up your dead, more inspiration, the Extreme Genes Patrons Club is for you. The rewards start at just a dollar a month. Find out more now. Just go to ExtremeGenes.com and click on our special Extreme Genes Patrons Club link at the top right. Or go to Patreon.com slash ExtremeGenes. 
Extreme Genes is sponsored in part by 23andMe.com, a personalized genetic service that helps you understand what your 23 pairs of chromosomes, your DNA, say about you. 23andMe.com gives you a snapshot view of your DNA with more than 60 detailed reports on your health, traits, and ancestry, plus tools to explore and compare your DNA with family and friends. 23andMe.com is the first and only genetic service available directly to you that includes reports that meet FDA standards. Here's how it works. Order your DNA kit from 23andMe.com. Provide your saliva sample from home and mail it back to a CLIA certified lab. Then you'll be notified when your reports are ready online. You'll also receive ongoing reports as new genetic discoveries are made and as 23andMe.com is able to clear new reports through the FDA. See why more than 1 million people are experiencing their genetics with 23andMe.com. Order your DNA kit today at 23andMe.com. Hey, it is time to talk DNA on Extreme Genes, America's family history show on ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth, and this segment is brought to you by FamilySearch.org. I got my friend Paul Woodbury on the line from LegacyTree.com. He's their DNA specialist. Paul, good to have you back on the show. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. Paul and I have uh, been talking this past week because uh, I've been helping a friend of mine trying to identify his birth father. And it's been kind of complicated. And we found through a DNA match that he had a first cousin. And there was a child of that first cousin who was coming in as a second to third or something like that. There were some differences there. The oddity of this was the first cousin was 20 years older than my friend. And so that would suggest that it was one of her uncles who would have been the father and born way back there. And it just didn't make a lot of sense. So I picked up the phone. I called Paul and I said, is there something I'm missing here? This is coming in at a solid first cousin. And we started talking about the levels of centimorgans there. In this case, my friend uses an ancestry test. And there's a little I next to the level of confidence when you look at a match. And when you click on that, you can see how many centimorgans are shared. Paul, talk about centimorgans. What is the significance of this? All right. Well, centimorgans are a measurement of genetic recombination. With autosomal DNA, you get half from your mom, half from your dad. And that half that you get from your dad is a mix of his paternal and his maternal DNA, and it undergoes a process called recombination. Right. Well, when DNA recombines, what happens is the maternal copy and the paternal copy line up together and they exchange genetic material. And at different points on any given chromosome, there's increased or decreased likelihood of recombination. And so because of that, centimorgans are an excellent measure of how closely related you might be to someone because it expresses the likelihood that two points on any given segment of DNA are inherited together. Okay. So when we talk about shared DNA, um, a lot of the times we'll talk about you know, the percentage of DNA that we share in common or the number of segments we share in common or the total number of base pairs that we share in common. But that can be a little bit misleading because you may share a large amount of DNA, but those segments of DNA could be in portions of the chromosome that are hard to access or hard to recombine with. Because of that, it may misrepresent exactly how much DNA you share in common with someone. So the problem is we have here then is we can have the same amount of DNA that you might see. For instance, grandparents and grandchildren have 25%. But so do yeah. aunts and uncles with nieces and nephews at 25%. So when you just read centimorgans, how would you tell them apart if you didn't already know the relationship? We'll get there. Um, okay. there's, a, there's a few clues that you can use for exploring those relationships. Blaine Bettinger has done an excellent job with the Shared Centimorgan Project. You can find at thegeneticgenealogist.com. And we're linking to that, by the way, at extremegenes.com, so you can see this. And he's done some research on how many centimorgans do you expect to share with individuals of 
different levels of relationship. And right. that, that can be really helpful. And um, some other great resources for evaluating the number of shared centimorgans and determining what level of relationship is most likely is a wiki page at the International Society of Genetic Genealogy entitled Autosomal DNA Statistics. And that can give you kind of a quick reference. And another resource that I use regularly is the Ancestry DNA Matching White Paper, which on page 32 of that report gives an excellent chart of how much DNA you would expect given different levels of relationship in terms of centimorgans. Now, in this case, you know, you and I were talking the other day, there was this first cousin relationship. It just was kind of odd because of the timing. And you looked at segments and said, you know what, I think this is probably a half ant. Now, you weren't absolutely certain, but you had a different take on it because of the number of segments shared. How does that come into play? Excellent point. So there is another blog by Graham Coop entitled GC Bias, and he has an article entitled, How Many Genomic Blocks Do You Share with a Cousin? And what he does is he goes through a statistical analysis of you know, if you share four blocks of DNA with somebody, at what level might you be related to that individual versus if you share 15 blocks of DNA. And with blocks, I like to look at the number of segments as well as the centimorgans because I think that it can sometimes point you to the most likely level of relationship. In this case, with centimorgans, you have many, many more data points to look at. So you have a much wider range to be able to look at. So the categories of relationship are more discreet. A first cousin most of the time will share a very different amount of DNA than a first cousin once removed or even a second cousin. Once you get beyond the level of second cousins, within centimorgans, the ranges begin to get a little bit fuzzy. The amount of DNA that you share with a third cousin might be the same amount of DNA that you share with a fourth cousin or a fourth cousin once removed. And the amount of DNA that you share with a fourth cousin might be the same amount of DNA that you share with an eighth cousin. So as you move further out in these relationships, the categories of what you would expect for that shared DNA become more fuzzy. Right, and that's why we see these ranges on all the sites, right? Fifth to eighth, they don't know. It's not because of the companies, it's just because that's how we inherit differently as we go further down the line from these people, right? Exactly. And you'll also notice that at the different companies, they will give smaller ranges for those closer levels of relationship. They have, you know, first to second cousin, and then they have second to fourth cousin, and then they have fourth to eighth cousin. And so it it grows as you get less shared DNA. With segments, you also get those ranges, but it gets fuzzy a lot faster. Now, wait a minute. When you talk about segments, are we also talking about blocks? You were talking about sharing certain blocks. Yeah, Is block that the same term? Segments, it's the same, same idea. Okay, all right. And so when you're dealing with blocks, you know, if you share, say, 40 segments of DNA with someone, that's indicative of a very close relationship. If you share 30 centimorgans, that's also indicative of a very close relationship. But if you get out to 10 or down to eight, seven, six, then the relationships get really fuzzy really fast. So in this case, my friend had a very high shared centimorgans, but a lower number of segments. Yes, and so what I will often do is I will consider the centimorgans and the segments in tandem. Now, technically, they are not independent variables, so we can't do joint probabilities on these variables. Sure. Because the number of centimorgans you have is going to depend in part on the number of segments you have, obviously. But as you look at these, you can begin to pinpoint which ones are the most likely levels of relationship. In this case, we looked at your friend's results, and he had a a really strong match that was typical of, in terms of centimorgans, was typical of a first cousin relationship. In fact, right on the exact number that uh, Blaine Bettinger has on his chart, 880. Yeah. So we were looking at that, and so it would suggest a first cousin relationship. But if you look at relationships, there are equivalent relationships. So a first cousin will share the same amount of DNA that you would expect to share with a great aunt, with a great grandparent, right, with a half aunt, 
Mm -hmm. or with a double first cousin once removed. (laughs) Okay. And when you look at these relationships, you have to remember that there are relationships that are genetically equivalent to each other. In this case, we were looking at the number of segments, and it just didn't quite match up with what we would expect for a first cousin relationship. My theory is that this person was a half aunt because what happens with segments is you'll often get, for example, you inherit 23 segments of DNA from your parents. Right. Right? You get 23 segments of DNA from your father, which happens to be, those segments happen to be the entire chromosome. And from each of your grandparents, you will often inherit between 23 and 40 segments. What happens is, as those segments come down through these successive generations of ancestry, first you'll increase in the number of segments that you share, and then you'll rapidly decrease as the relationships become more distant. So what I was thinking in this case is that it's likely a half-ant because they were sharing only 23 segments of DNA, which is anomalous for a first-cousin relationship. But in this case, there's only been three generational steps. There's been only three opportunities to break up that DNA into a larger number of segments. And so that's why it's a smaller number, and that's why you could look at the two together and go, this isn't quite a first cousin. This has got to be a half ant. Amazing. Yeah, and that plus the context within which we were looking at these Sure. Um, that these relationships, because there's an age difference. At That's right. Genealogical relationships. There's this age difference. There's who are the candidates, who's matching from among her parents. Right. And so we we're only able to see connections to one side of her family. Right. That's really pointing to a half relationship, and a half aunt relationship is equivalent genetically to a first cousin relationship. I think we have been schooled, Paul. As always. <laughs> Thanks so much. This is one of those segments I'm going to have to go back and listen to a couple of times because it's kind of a 303 level DNA course. But nonetheless, it's fantastic and obviously very helpful for certain people who run into some of these strange relationships as they try to figure out their DNA matches. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise and great to have you on again. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Wow. Good stuff. All right. Coming up next in five minutes, we talk to Maureen Taylor. She's the photo detective talking about houses in photographs. Coming up on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Scientific studies have proven that youth who know even a little bit about their family history perform better academically and have a greater sense of personal confidence and stability. Genealogy is its own incredible superpower that arms our children with super strength. But how do you get your child or grandchild interested in studying their family history? That kind of stuff is just for grandmas, right? Not anymore. ZapTheGrandmaGap.com leaps the generation gap in a single bound. Author Janet Havorka provides you with useful and timely advice on helping the young people in your life become engaged in their own family history. Janet has an entire collection of books to inspire the young and the young at heart in fun, interactive ways. She also offers creative tips and advice on her blog and in her free weekly newsletter. Stop by ZapTheGrandmaGap.com today to sign up for Janet's free email newsletter with 52 weeks of easy tips, free downloads, and order your set of resource books and workbooks. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chart Masters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartMasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chart Masters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Masters option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. Hey, 
It's Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show, and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. And uh, this segment is brought to you by LegacyTree.com. So excited to have my good friend Maureen Taylor, the photo detective, back on the show. Maureen, how are you? I'm great, Scott. How are you? Uh, you know, always excited to talk to you, always excited to talk genealogy and all of its magnificent phases. And uh, one of them is photographs. And one of the things that got us to talking at one time was a picture I found of my dad from back in the 1920s, and it had a house behind it. And I, it was very interesting to try to figure out where was this picture taken because the house was kind of unique. It had a very flat top to it. And you gave me some good advice on that. And let, let's get into houses and photographs and how we can use those for identity, for the times that these pictures were taken, and what they can tell about a story. I love houses and pictures, <laughs> maybe because I live in a historic house. Okay. There were itinerant photographers who traveled around and actually sort of knocked on doors and asked people to come out and stand in their front yard and have their pictures taken. And my favorites of those are the ones out on the prairie yes. where you have the people in front of the sod house and you have the whole family all dressed up and then they have the horse. <laughs> of course, got to have the horse. What eras are we talking about? What was the earliest time these photographers were out there doing their thing? There were itinerant photographers fairly early on, 1860s for sure. There were actually, obviously, daguerreotypes from the 1840s. But you needed certain conditions to take those pictures, so mostly they sure. were done in the studio. Some were done outside, so I'm not going to say there are no early, early photographs of people in front of houses. But they're pretty popular by the 1860s. Here's a little known fact. 1860s realtors, people selling houses yeah. or offering houses for rent, would use pictures of those very nice houses and then use them to advertise that the house is for sale. Isn't that amazing? Like you'd, hand, you'd hand out little <laughs> carte de visites, those little cards that are yeah. two and a half by four inches, and you'd, you'd hand them out to particular people you know, that could afford a particular house. Have you ever been house. able to find a photo of your historic home? Not yet. But the other day I was doing some research on the neighborhood, and I was quite fascinated with it all. And so I have some research that I'm going to do to try to trace some of those families and see if any of them have pictures of this house. When we moved in, a friend of mine actually worked in the city archive, and they came over to say congratulations on the house, and he handed me a copy of a document from when the house was built. Oh, that's so fun. And you, you can that learn a so lot fun. about your house then by finding records like this and hopefully leading to photographs. In my case, with this picture I was describing at the beginning of the segment here, it was a picture of my dad, and there was a second one of him with his grandmother, who was born in 1846, standing side by side. Dad's about 10 years old, so it's about 1925. He's got a baseball right. mitt on. And mm -hmm. behind him is this very odd-looking house with this flat top on it. And, of course, I have no idea exactly where it was taken because I know my dad was raised in northern New Jersey, a place I have visited very seldom. So the first thing I thought was, okay, let's look up his neighborhood because I knew where he lived. I'd right. never been there. And I went and did a Google satellite search for the neighborhood, and I could see that same house with the same weird flat top from up above and i'm going that's okay right. that's the house look you can see some of the dormer windows that kind of thing you know then you do google street level and i was able to determine that this was the house that was directly across the street that my dad grew up in so in 2013 i visited that place for the first time and was able to determine the exact spot that photograph the two photographs were taken and it was pretty fun because the house looks very much the same with a few changes on it. But I know that it's been around for <laughs> close to 100 years now. Right. We have this photograph of my husband's great-grandparents in front of their house in Rochester, New York. And it's a big family gathering. And I'm still trying to figure out exactly who every single person is. But right. I have a lot of them, right? And they're standing in front of this house. And I thought, what's the chance? I have the address from census records and other things. And I looked it up on Google Street View, and there's the house. It still stands. Yeah. But the neighborhood all around it, several of the houses that you can see in this old photograph, this late 19th century, photo, early 20th century photograph, 
are no longer there. Right, and that's the beauty of using street level for this kind of thing. You can identify buildings. I was just recently looking up a New York building from the 1800s that my ancestors used as an office. Of course, it's not there anymore, but you know, you never know what the neighborhoods look like today that you still might find an ancestor's place. I've got a second great-grandfather's home that is still in use in New York City that's at least 160 years old. That's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty good. My grandmother, my father's mother, was the only grandparent I knew. And every Sunday, we would take her for a drive because that's what she liked to do. And the drive always consisted of going to see all the places where she had spent her life, all the houses that she had ever lived in. And some of them, of course, were gone even at that point. But now, when I look back and I use Google Street View to try to find the places where all of her relatives ever lived... Their parking lot, yeah, gas stations, yeah. And, you know, oh, there's it's painful. Never a house, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's painful. That's right. And painful. Once in a while, hopefully, you're going to get something that that lasts. I have a place over in England, a fifth grade lived in and uses his butcher shop, but it became an historic landmark because this is where a bunch of industrialists created a petition to Parliament so that they could start the first public railway in the history of the world in the 1830s. So they made this building at that time uh, an historic landmark, and so it's still preserved today. It's a pub, so, you know, I can go in there and celebrate my ghosts, which has been a very fun thing for me to do because this building actually dates back to the 1600s. That's very cool. Yeah, That's very cool. it's a lot of fun. So I went to an antique shop in New Hampshire, and sitting in a bin was a little photograph of people standing in front of a business, and it said cobbler shop, and it named the town. And I thought, I can't leave this. You know, it was yes. $5, and I was like, I, I can't leave it here. I can could, I could maybe figure this out. So I spent, I can't tell you how much time, using street view and maps going up and city directories going up and down the main street looking for this cobbler shop. And in the end, I was never able to really identify the location, and neither was the historical society. Huh. But I donated the picture because it was a piece of their history. It was a sort of a hunting expedition for me, but really valuable to them. And we were coming back from, I think, my sister-in-law's house, and we drove down this road, and I remember saying, I recognize the street. I'd spent so much time on it in the virtual world that when we were there in, in real time, um, I felt like I was, you know, there, there it was. I was still looking for the cobbler shop. Isn't that funny? Uh, you go around a, a place. I'm at the point right now, frankly, where I can't remember whether I've actually been down a certain road or whether I thought I have because I followed it along on Google Street View just to see what was around there. Exactly. Exactly. You can get completely carried away by it. And so one of the things I use it for is not just to identify the places in the pictures, be they family pictures or pictures I pick up that I'm interested in, but I am active here in the city of Providence in which I live in the preservation of the city. And so sometimes I'll go by a place and I'll see, like, they ripped that house down last week, and I go on Google Street View and it hasn't caught up yet. And so I I can take a snapshot of what yeah, was there. Absolutely. Um, and that helps a lot. If anybody wants to read about the cobbler shop and my search for that cobbler shop, it's on my blog at MaureenTaylor.com. All right. She's Maureen Taylor. She's the photo detective. Always a pleasure, Maureen. Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks, Scott. And coming up next, Tom Perry, our Preservation Authority, continuing his preservation tour. Where is he? We'll find out coming up in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Well, Genies, my personal family history researcher who sends me new information day and night has sent me some incredible new records and newspaper stories lately. Hi, it's Fisher, and the name of that researcher, by the way, is MyHeritage.com. It's the hardest working service in genealogy, looking for records of your family 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yes, even while you're sleeping. How does it work? MyHeritage uses hundreds of algorithms to match your ancestors to over 5 billion records from around the world. 
world and with 97% accuracy. That means no more wasting time figuring out whether or not a match really is a match. I hear from listeners all the time who are shocked with how much information is accurately found and then passed along. And now my heritage will translate your ancestors' names into English or any other language you like from foreign records. In fact, it works with over 40 languages. No one else does this. Whether you're a beginner or seasoned researcher, you need MyHeritage.com. Extreme Genes is sponsored in part by 23andMe.com, a personalized genetic service that helps you understand what your 23 pairs of chromosomes, your DNA, say about you. 23andMe.com gives you a snapshot view of your DNA with more than 60 detailed reports on your health, traits, and ancestry, plus tools to explore and compare your DNA with family and friends. 23andMe.com is the first and only genetic service available directly to you that includes reports that meet FDA standards. Here's how it works. Order your DNA kit from 23andMe.com. Provide your saliva sample from home and mail it back to a CLIA certified lab. Then you'll be notified when your reports are ready online. You'll also receive ongoing reports as new genetic discoveries are made and as 23andMe.com is able to clear new reports through the FDA. See why more than 1 million people are experiencing their genetics with 23andMe.com. Order your DNA kit today at 23andMe.com. Legacy Tree Genealogists is a proud sponsor of Extreme Genes. Based in Salt Lake City, Utah, near the world's largest family history library, we've been working with genealogists all over the globe since 2004 to track down records, find your ancestors, and the stories that bring your legacy to life. We also analyze DNA test results, help you join lineage societies, and find missing cousins or heirs to property. Legacy Tree is the recommended research partner of MyHeritage.com and is the world's highest client-rated genealogy firm. Call us toll-free at 1-800-818-1476. Call now or register online to get a free estimate. Learn from our free genealogy tips on our blog at LegacyTree.com slash blog. Even experienced researchers can benefit from our proven and experienced staff of specialists who can bring new approaches to old problems. Legacy Tree Genealogists. We do the research. You enjoy the discoveries. LegacyTree.com. Time to talk preservation at Extreme Genes, America's family history show at ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. And this segment is brought to you by 23andMe.com DNA. Tom Perry, our preservation authority, continues his preservation tour. He is on the road. Where are you this week, Tom? Yeah, we're finishing up a really busy weekend. We're kind of multitasking. We've got the Utah State Fair, which we're finishing up. We've met a lot of genies, which has been a lot of fun. And we've had a crew down at St. George for the amazing exhibitions they've had down there this weekend too so we're going to finish those up and take a little bit of a breath and look forward to our next trip of course and uh, salt lake city in utah is kind of the mecca of the genealogical world so i'm sure you're meeting a lot of genies there that's great well this is very interesting you shared with me a question that one of our genie listeners actually sent to us natalie and natalie wrote about a problem she's got and she said basically back 20 years ago she had a whole bunch of old family photos scanned professionally and saved to a Kodak CD. Now, that sounds like she's forward thinking, right? And, exactly. Yeah. And they put it in a PCD format. Now, I have never heard of a format like that. And she said she's only now discovering that Photoshop cannot directly open these formats. So she went online. She found a converter for it. And that allowed her to open the files and uh, save them in a TIFF format. Well, the converted photos, she said, now almost look like negatives. And she put one on here, and it's just absolutely amazing. It is a couple. It looks like their wedding day. You can see the uh, the woman holding flowers in her lap and the, the man looming behind her. But all, the, <laughs> all that you would think would be dark or some kind of shade of gray or whatever is a blue color, an ocean blue. And then the figures themselves are in some kind of pink shade. So, wow, Uh, obviously, I think Photoshop could probably do wonders for this particular picture, but she's got lots of them. What do you think she should be doing here, Tom? And tell us about that old format. Yeah, that's really funny. Back in the day, people just created their own format, so it's not recognizable by any other software because the software says, hey, I've never heard of this. 
What I would like her to do is actually send me some of the JPEGs or the TIFFs before she did any conversion. If you've got some kind of a file format, even if it's weird and can't open it, see if she can at least email it to me or make a copy of the disk and send that to me. So I have a lot of different programs that open things as well. And what my impression from looking at this is the interpolation of it is what's messed up. So it went and substituted wrong colors for what it's supposed to be. So I doubt that they would have deteriorated to this kind of, you know, the blues, the greens, the reds, these really awful colors. And so I think something in the conversion process kind of corrupted the colors. So if I can get original files, I might be able to open them in something. And if so, it will be an easy fix. If not, if this is the only thing we have to work with, as you mentioned, Photoshop is absolutely wonderful for doing things like this. What I would do first, before you go in and try drawing and cleaning up and doing these things, because it almost looks like a reverse negative, right. is go in with some different filters. Uh, there are some different fillers you can lay over it that will do some different things with the color balance. If that doesn't work, then you can actually go into color manipulation, and you can actually like grab these waveforms with your mouse and drag them up and down, left and right, and kind of mess around with it until you see things the way that they're supposed to be. And the third option is you can go in and you can do a find and replace. Or you can go into like the blue color, whatever, and find and say, hey, I really want this to be white. And mess around with this on different layers. Just make sure you take your original and make a duplicate of it on the layer, duplicate, duplicate, duplicate. And then go and label them what you did to them. So if you go, aha, this is what works. And then you come back a week later and go, what was it that I did? <laughs> yeah, that happens a lot, doesn't it? It does. All right, Tom, we got to take a break. What are we going to talk to after that break? We've had some people write into us about different kinds of film and different kind of canisters and cases, wondering if it, too, can either be developed or if it's been developed, if it can still be transferred. All right, we'll get to that in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chartmasters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartmasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chartmasters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Master's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. When was the last time you heard your grandmother's voice or saw your family enjoying life back in the 1950s or 60s? If the reason is you haven't known what to do with your old recordings, videos, and films, here's your answer. The Multimedia Center in Salt Lake City. We brought in a video project to the Multimedia Center, and overnight, they duplicated it to DVD so we could meet our deadline. The Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to Transfer Duplication. Com. Genies, it's Fisher with exciting news. The Weekly Genie, the official newsletter of Extreme Genes, is here. It's your Monday morning briefing on what's happening in the world of genealogy and family history and on Extreme Genes. Get all the details of jaw-dropping stories of discovery and keep up with the latest techniques in family history research. Get to know more about your favorite Extreme Genes personalities. And it's free. Sign up for The Weekly Genie now at ExtremeGenes.com or the Extreme Genes Facebook page. And when you do, you'll receive David Allen Lambert's top 10 tips for beginning genealogists from the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society. Sign up today for the Weekly Genie. All 
right, we are back. Final segment of Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. It is Fisher here, the Radio Root Sleuth, with Preservation Authority Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com. By the way, referring back to Natalie's email last segment there, Tom, it's interesting to note the fact that she went through and did the most modern thing available for her to preserve her stuff back in the 90s, and now there's nothing out there that reads that format. We're certainly heading down the same path, say, in the 2030s or 40s for some of the stuff we're doing right now. Oh, yeah, and people have to be very careful. We have people bring us in three-and-a-half-inch floppy disks all the time, and they want us to make it into something readable. And all we really can do is convert it from a floppy to a disk. It's still going to be the same zeros and the same ones. It's just now you have a format that you can actually insert it into your computer, and hopefully you're going to find some kind of a translator out there We'll open it. All right. We have a, another Genie email here. It's from uh, Sean Stringham. And, Sean, it shows actually a photograph, uh, and, and it looks like he's just holding open a whole bunch of old family home movies. And there's that name again on the box, Kodak. And he said, hey, I was wondering if you can transfer these. Well, first of all, what are those, Tom? Well, you, that's interesting, too, because Eastman Kodak and other people like Agfa and things that did the old Super 8s, Regular 8s, they had different cartridges. Everybody was coming up with something fancy. Like back in the day, they had the carousels for slides. They had the cubes. They had the inline kind of carousel type things, different sizes of carousels. So we get weird things like this that they're like in a weird case. And it's like, hey, you know, I don't even have a machine that can play this on. I don't have my projector. Am I out of luck? And 99% of the time, we're able to open those up. Sometimes we can surgically open them or we have to cut them open, at least be able to get your film out of them. And a lot of times we have people... It comes, like if you look in this box, you can see a little can in a corner. Right. And it looks like what's called a 100-foot roll of film. And people get confused, and they say, oh, hey, I have these 200-foot roll of films. No, not really. You had this one roll of film that actually went through the machine twice. They ran it, you flipped it over, then you ran it again, then you developed it. And then what Kodak would do, they would take this 16-millimeter film that you just shot through your camera twice and cut it into two eight, And so then you have two 50-foot rolls of film, where this one really started out as a 25-foot roll. So people get confused. They say, well, this is 25, but it says 50, it says 100. What is it really? <laughs> so you're able to rescue most of this stuff, no matter what oh, absolutely. the containers are. And, and is this typical around the country, Tom? Yeah, it is. There's actually a place in Atlanta called Film Rescue. And they make their own chemicals because obviously Kodak got out of the business years ago, but they only do it like four times a year. So if you have the old film, you know, you can give us a call. We'll give you the phone number or you can look them up on the Internet. It's called Film Rescue. But you need to find out when they're going to be running your processing. And if you say, well, what kind of processing do I need? Usually on the box or the can, they'll say like C64 or something like that. If you can't find any writing on it whatsoever, do just like this person did. Send them a picture of the box, of the film, anything that might have any notes on it at all. And a lot of times they can look at this and say, oh, this was Eastman Kodak, but it wasn't New York. It was Los Angeles. And in their Los Angeles places, this is what they were doing. And so a lot of times they can figure out what kind of processing it's supposed to need, and then they can process it for you properly. Then we can scan it. And then you've got your DVDs, your Blu-rays, or whatever it is that you need. All right. Awesome stuff. Thanks so much. And by the way, if you have a question for Tom, you can reach out to him through email at asktom at tmcplace.com or go on to his Twitter page at asktomp. Thanks so much, Tom. Talk to you next week. Sounds perfect. My pleasure. Hey, that's a wrap for this week. Hey, we want to welcome our very first members of our Extreme Jeans Patrons Club. You can go to patreon.com slash extreme jeans or just go to the Patrons Club link at extremejeans.com. Welcome to Adam Mendoza, Chiara Delavecchia Osborne, James Perrine, Dolores Brown, Joyce Randall Senecal. It's a growing community. We want you to be a part of it. It's a great way to support the show and get all kinds of great rewards as well, including early access to the podcast, bonus podcast for members only and live online chats talk to you again next week thanks for joining us and remember as far as everyone knows we're a nice normal family
Hey, Genies, I'm not quite done yet because I got to thank our very first members of our Extreme Genes Patrons Club. They're kind of in my Hall of Fame because they're the first ones in. Adam Mendoza, he's actually the very first Patron Club member. So thank you so much, Adam. We got Penny Patchett, Dolores Brown, Chiara Delavecchia Osborne, James Perrine, Joyce Randall Senecal. Thank you guys so much for coming on. And all they're doing is going to patreon.com slash extreme genes or to extremegenes.com and clicking on the patrons club. And they're just pledging a dollar to eight bucks a month for all kinds of great benefits being mentioned on the show, being listed on the website, getting early access to our podcast, getting bonus members only podcasts twice a month. And we're going to be doing a monthly ask me anything live online session with all kinds of great genealogical guests. So sign up and take advantage of the rewards. And thanks once again to all our new members.